Hi, I'm Patrick. Um, I'm a software engineer at a company called Topbox. Uh, I live in the JavaScript team, but I work on automated testing uh, across all of our platforms, which are iOS, Android, uh, Linux, Windows, and we have server infrastructure. Who is Topbox? Uh, our delightful marketing team sent me the standard spiel. Uh, Topbox develops and operates OpenTalk, which is a global platform that makes it possible to embed real-time video, voice, messaging, and collaboration experiences into websites and apps. What is that really? It means that we provide SDKs that you can drop into your application to provide real-time communication. Um, and what, what am I here to do? I'm here to tell you the story of how Topbox has embraced automated testing uh, and hopefully convince you that you need to drop everything and embrace automated testing as well. Why do I feel so strongly that each and every one of you should be using automated testing? Without automated testing, you're shipping bugs to your users. Bugs that could easily have been prevented, or much worse, bugs that have shipped before. Now, I don't know about you, but we like to release quite often. Our server platform releases updates every six weeks. Our client SDKs every four months. You can't do that if you're manually testing everything. And, you know, we have a slightly unique constraint. We don't just target an iPhone. We don't just try target an iPad. We target something like 54 different browser versions. And there's multiple release chains. There's operating systems. There's operating system versions. And even on the mobile side, we target something like 10 different mobile operating system versions and CPU configurations. So before any release goes out, we execute thousands of tests so that we can be confident that we're not going to break third-party applications, even if their users are using a mixture of our SDKs. Now, before going into any detail, uh, I'll let you in on the real secret, and that is making testing a priority. A story, or a task, or ticket, whatever your system calls it, isn't complete unless a test is written and passes. A bug isn't fixed unless a test is written and passes. That means you, you need management buy-in. You need your product or your um, project management team to, to acknowledge the importance of testing and to schedule it. Uh, so how, how did we do it? We started with unit test. Uh, Everyone knows what a unit test is? Does everyone know what a unit test is? Yeah. Hopefully. <coughs> awesome. Uh, every component, every single server component, every single client SDK, they get their own unit tests. You know, OK. In some ways, unit tests are easy. You're testing small little chunks of code. The first one can be hard. You need to figure out what you need to mock. Uh, you, know, you don't want to touch real-world external services, your database. Uh, but once you've done that, they get easier. Uh, you can reuse your mocks. People get used to doing it. They become part of your process. And they have this massive advantage of that. They're usually quite fast to run. Our JavaScript client uh, has 300 unit tests. They take four seconds to run. That means that you can have them running continuously as you're developing code. Every time you hit save in a file, browser opens somewhere in the background, the tests run. Obviously, if you're dealing with mobile devices, things can be a little bit slower. Uh, if you live in Xcode, which I'm guessing a lot of us do, uh, there are some pretty good tools built in. Uh, XC test is there these days. Uh, you might use something on top of it. Uh, I, I've played with Xcode Server. I use it a little bit. In practice, I find it really hard to integrate. Uh, I'm also going to make a quick assumption that everyone here uses source control um, and that you're familiar with Git. If you're not, uh, I use the word pull request. Uh, just they mean I would like to merge some code into another branch. And the reason I bring up pull requests is 
they are a perfect opportunity to implement checks. Now, that's code review, having someone else look at your code, but also a chance to automatically run your tests. So we run uh, unit tests on every single pull request, and if they don't pass, then your pull request is not merged. Uh, if you use GitHub, uh, which we do, it has really good integration for this stuff. I wish there was a way to make the merge pull request button go away entirely if the tests were failing, but you just have to rely on everyone doing the right thing. And I don't know, throw things at them if they don't. The, the next thing we bring in is integration tests. This one's pretty critical for us because we have servers and clients, and multiple clients. Uh, if you have a server component, even one managed by someone else, like CloudKit or PARS, then you need to test against their platform as well as unit tests without it. Uh, we wrote our own uh, because integration testing doesn't seem to have great tools. Uh, I, when I say integration testing, I mean end-to-end -end testing, not so much user interface. Um, for us, that started by building something in a browser that was able to bring in our JavaScript SDK, acquire a camera, bring up another tab that opened another, uh, connected as well, and just check that video and everything works. Then, then you just add 300 more of those tests and you're done. Uh, fortunately, these kind of tests take more time. Um, admittedly, you know, 20 minutes to run all these tests. It's not too bad, but not great. Uh, the bad side to that really is that no one bothers to run the tests constantly. So you need to run them automatically. And, I mean, then you need to deal with deploying all your various system components. So an automatically deployed environment that packages all of your components together, releases them, and tests them together was the key for us. Um, we call it a nightly environment. In reality, it is run nightly, but also every time something hits one of our master or develop branches, we automatically kick off a full suite of tests that make sure that everything works together. And then we have a goal that every single test or every single test fail, uh, failure will pass again within a day. There are, there are a few ways you can do that. You can back out a breaking change, that's quite valid, or you can fix it, or you know, fix the test. And you know, let's talk about some tools. Continu integra uh, continuous integration is really helpful for us. I would suggest even if you're working by yourself, continuous integration is really helpful to keep yourself honest. Uh, we use Jenkins. I don't love it. It's self-hosted. Java uses lots of RAM. But it's what we have. Uh, Travis CI and Bill Kite seem like really good options. We, we also use Travis CI actually for our open source projects. Um, can be a little bit easier to set up. For us, the, the key for CI is it helps pull some of the burden off our QA team. So the automated tests run before QA even have to look at things, which makes the developers more responsible for it. Uh, and I, I know I just said I wrote a tool myself, and I'm going to talk more about writing my own tools, but I want to stress avoid writing them yourself for the simple reason you'll never, ever stop working on them. Uh, try and adapt existing tools. Look and see what extensions can be added. You'll probably save yourself a ton of time and hassle. And yeah, sometimes, sometimes you'll just, you'll give in and you'll have to write them. So for us, the thing that existing tools just, just didn't do was dealing with interaction between multiple installations of an app. So for you, that might be synchronizing user data. It might be communication, like your Facebook Messenger. Or it might even be real-time communication, where 
you've got a multiplayer game, or perhaps an app that lets a grandparent and a, grand and a grandchild read a book together across the world. They can see each other, and as they change the pages, the screens update. It's a real app that embeds Topbox. And we need to be able to test endpoints together. So before a release, we need to make sure that browsers and mobile devices are able to talk to each other. That video will flow, that audio flows, that data flows. And for that, we need to be able to bring multiple endpoints online in a single test. And just to give you an idea of the kind of endpoints that we're testing, that means Chrome, Firefox, IE, across four versions of Windows, four versions of the Mac, and the stable, stable beta developer and nightly slash canary versions of all of those browsers. On mobile, that means 32-bit uh, and 64-bit on iOS 7, 8, and 9, uh, and recent versions of Android with both ARM and Intel processors. Um, and of course, we can't forget about users who haven't upgraded yet. So if one of your users is on version one of your app, and one of your users on version two, what happens when they try and talk? Does it work, which is great? Does it fail, and they just get a connection failed error? Not great. Does it crash, which is much worse? So we came up with a little tool. We called it Quokka because I didn't do a good enough job of searching the web to see if anyone else had a tool called that. And we can do tests across endpoints with that. Uh, yeah, this is my blurb say. Need both Chrome and an app deployed on iOS for a test? That's what Quokka is for. Uh, that's what a Quokka looks like. Uh, I happen to think they're quite adorable. If you've never seen one in real life, they're, they're tiny. Um, in practice, I tend to look at screens more like this. Uh, we use, uh, so Quokka in production is a cluster uh, of 21 machines. Uh, as someone said earlier, OS 10 and virtual machines, not a great mix. Uh, also, we are testing physical hardware, so we're using iOS devices and Android devices, and we're using USB webcams. And in our experience, mixing those with virtual machine infrastructure leads to false positives, or well, false negatives, false failures on your tests. And as a developer, there's nothing I hate more than coming in to find an email in the morning saying, the test failed, and then running them again and everything passes, simply because you need to run them again. Um, in, in code, it, it, Quokka itself provides an API. You connect to it, you say, I want Chrome, and then you say, I want Chrome to load this URL, or I want an iOS device, and I want it to load an application from this URL. Uh, it also provides a, a matrix so you can say, or the concept of a matrix, so you can say I want Chrome and Android and so on together, uh, simply so that individual test frameworks sitting on top of Quokka don't need to implement that themselves. Uh, then, then we actually had to write a test framework. Uh, unfortunately, despite my best efforts, I was unable to find a test framework that supported multiple endpoints well. I didn't want to write one, I was forced to. So I came up with two possible approaches. Option A is actually pretty common, uh, which is push the logic to the endpoints. So you write the, the test in the code that runs on the device. And if you have two of them, then you just provide a way to, to get events between them as needed. And then just at the end, have the app exit or whatever with a success signal. Or option B was keeping the logic in the test runner and have the, the thing that runs on the endpoint be very simple. It just takes commands like start and stop and, uh, and emits events like something happened. We went with uh, option A for Repel Runner. Repel was our integration test system. We needed a way to run that across lots more devices. And, okay, yeah, it worked. It's not great because the progress, like if you're watching a test run, 
you end up having to look at lots of machines to see what's happening. Then we started working on the, uh, the multi-endpoint tests. And I started by writing a, a tool called Yardstick, which was an even worse name. And it worked in kind of a, a bridge way. You write a test in JavaScript, it sends JavaScript to the endpoints to execute, and waits for responses. Uh, the downside, writing pure code was nice for me, someone who has been writing JavaScript for over a decade. It wasn't great for any of our other teams, especially the people who never worked with JavaScript on the mobile team. So we, we went back to the drawing board and we came up with the simulator JS, which is option B. And it works by having a very simple protocol full of commands and events. The tests are still written in JavaScript, um, which is a bit of a challenge for the less JavaScript friendly teams, but they're getting used to it. We couple it with a native app uh, on iOS and Android. We don't use JavaScript in those at all. It's all native code, just easier that way. Uh, and so we end up with something, you write the test once, and it runs across all of our endpoints. Um, this is my favorite test, which just fails. Um, it's very useful for testing your failing logic, uh, which is important. And here's a, a slightly more real test that uh, sends a command to the, this pub dot person saying, connect a session, and then initialize a, a, a camera, and then publish that camera. Which means there's a little bit of work for each endpoint. You have to implement the command handling code in each endpoint every time such as you know, acquire camera, publish the session. For most tests, we don't need to add new features this way, though. They're, or, uh, they're just simply combining things that already exist, and so it's a lot simpler. The downside is, if 20 minutes for the integration test seemed bad, these ones take seven hours across our entire test, uh, test matrix. Uh, fortunately, we could make it faster by throwing more hardware at it. Uh, but it's worth it because we test every version of the SDK that we support. So that's five versions back of our SDK across the 54 browsers and the 10 mobile uh, variants before we do a release. That means that even though we technically only support maybe the last two major versions, we know before we ship a release on the server or on the client if we're going to break client applications in the wild. And the, uh, the ways that we might resolve that might be to fix it in the server side if we can, or it might be by proactively communicating to the people using SDK on a version that won't work. Uh, we, we also have this fun other thing that we deal with. Uh, and this one we've only started working with for the last year is the network. Now, Topbox being real-time communications, we battle the network. Uh, it can be particularly unforgiving uh, of things like high latency, low bandwidth, jitter, uh, packet loss. And if your application handles these, like ours do, and yours should, you'll need a way to simulate them for testing, uh, even during development. Fortunately, we have PF on the Mac. Uh, lets you filter, uh, filter your, your network connection. Uh, for example, Topbox is largely UDP, but we need to test whether we work in the absence of that. Uh, documentation is pretty terrible in my experience. So Google it and eventually you'll find one set of rules that will work. Apple also provide network link conditioner. Uh, Google it. NS Hipster has a great article on getting it all set up. It's available on both the Mac and iOS and lets you set things like packet loss and latency to simulate connections that your users might have. That's great, and I love it, but it's not so great for automated testing. So, of course, we ended up writing another tool for that. 
Uh, PyNetM is simply a front end to IPFW and TC on Lurx. Uh, we run it on, stand, on Ubiquity Edge routers. They're wonderful little routers, they're 150 bucks. They run Linux, they can route at hundreds of megabits when it's not doing emulation, 40-ish when they are, uh, but they're cheap, they're wonderful. Uh, PyNetM it provides a REST API so that we can set rules on demand during automated testing so you can get nice repeatable results. Uh, of course, Facebook make a similar tool called Augmented, tra uh, augmented Traffic Control. It runs on standard Linux machines. Um, it didn't exist. I wish it did. Probably would have saved us a bunch of time. But I still love the little edge routers. Um, so, what are the lessons that I've learned from, from this process of embracing automated testing? Tests are everyone's problem. Tests can't be the domain of QA, they must be the domain of every single developer. Leaving it to QA just leads to the QA department hating you. Uh, start small. Yeah, the, in the last session, someone asked, where, where do you start? Start with a bug. Fix that bug, write a test for it while you're doing it. And having a rule that all tests must pass. As soon as you allow one test to, to fail or one test to flap, then it becomes really easy for people to become complacent. So have, it, have them all be green. Refactor your tests. After you've written a few tests, you'll find that you're doing things again and again and again, and you'll end up with a test file that's thousands of lines long, and no one wants to maintain it anymore. So find those things and put them into a library, or write a DSL if you have to, um, and you like writing your own tools. And do we have time for a demo? Maybe, it's not very exciting. So I'll, I'll skip it and questions afterwards. Um, so as of today, we have about a thousand unit tests across uh, the platform. Uh, our various mobile SDKs share a large common core, so the, the number looks a bit small to me. Uh, several hundred integration tests, uh, there's about 300 on the JS side, roughly similar number on the mobile side. Large number of performance tests that run automatically as well. And then we have the big interop tests, which at the time I submitted the talk, there are, ran in the order of 10,000. We've written a whole bunch more tests, and now it's about 25. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, thank you.